Hello, everybody, and welcome to You Got Got, our Game of Thrones podcast. My name is Carly. My name is Sophia. And this week we are talking about the episode called The Queen's Justice, was it? <laughs> yeah, you Good. got it. I tried. There was a lot of justice for a lot of queens in this episode. <laughs> so it, it's... You're not wrong about that. I'm not wrong. It's true. I mean, it really was. Quick side note, I just wanted to say, today is actually the 21st birthday of the first book of Game of Thrones. What? Uh, it came out today, 21 years ago. Raise a glass. Oh so, my god. So everybody, please raise a glass, raise water, whatever you have. Today is the day everything started. Today is the day the world got introduced to the world of Westeros. Oh my god. And the world changed forever. And the world changed forever. So happy birthday. Game of Thrones. Happy birthday, Game of Thrones. Um, we are so excited that the season has finally seemed to pick up some speed. Mm-hmm. Um, after two episodes of a lot of exposition and a lot of talking that wasn't super great to listen to. It was more like, we're sending a raven. Next scene, we just received a raven. And you can only watch so much of that before it gets really, really freaking old really fast. Um, and I feel like this is finally the episode we got to where um, there was a lot of dialogue, but it was all very productive to listen to and interesting to listen to and paid off very well yeah it got us it got us where we needed to go it did in a way that was extremely unexpected a lot of things happened in this episode that i did not see coming in any way i think the whole sort of balance has been shifted yes in westeros now after this episode has happened um the timing of this episode felt totally different and totally um i mean just better just it was yeah. a it was really well timed out. The conversations that they had, like you said, meant something. Like there was meat to every single word, every single sentence that was being spoken. Like I wanted to listen again. I wa- it was the first episode of the season that I wanted to go back and rewatch immediately. Same yeah, exactly. Like it and there was so much that happened, but also just so many satisfying things that happened. And a yes. lot of conversations that you needed to listen to twice. Absolutely. Um, you yeah. don't hear it the first time. You miss the, you know, you miss the subtle nuances the first time through. Exactly. Exactly. Even if they are kind of nods to like, remember when this happened in season one? Like, yeah, because there, there were a lot of those. throwbacks. There were a lot of throwbacks, which like, I personally, I'm okay with that. I know Absolutely. a lot of people are bothered by it. Like, I've seen a few headlines that have been like, um, uh, it seems like the characters are just kind of reha- recapping the show for themselves. Like, I saw that as a headline. I don't remember which site that was. I don't really mind it. I think when you're on the, oh boy, seventh season? Is this yes, the seventh? Yes, wow, seventh geez. season, baby. Whoa, how? Um, I think when you've gotten this far and when you've worked up to something as big as, you know, these final battles, however they may go, you need a little bit of that. Like, we want to see the show be like, this is where we've been, this is where we are now, Absolutely. where is it going to go from here? And to to extend on that point even further, I mean, it's a complicated show. Yeah. There are a lot of characters, a lot of hidden plots, a lot of caveats in this show that you would not catch the, if you've only watched it one time through. Yeah. As well as like characters that might not matter, that actually do matter that exactly. you haven't seen in a long time, like like Beric Dondarrion, Thoros of Mir, these characters that you might not expect to see again that you really you get to see again. Like Jorah, we didn't know that he was going to be such a big character this season. I thought no. he was going to sort of take a take a step back this season, but he's rearing to go. He's a he's on his way back to Dragonstone now. As of this episode, he is oh yeah healed and on his way back. You know, and so. There's there's something to be said for the way that this episode is worked and and sort of was edited out and and they made a lot of changes in the editing style. You yes, know? which was great. Like the voiceover that Tyrion has um, during the the on Clash Clash Rock, Rock. Yeah. that was amazing. And like it's very rare, I feel like, in this show to have not clever editing because it's, it's a clever show, but like mm-hmm. to have um, artistic editing. Yes. Uh, it was a big deal when we had the flashback to Cersei as a kid um, meeting the witch. It was a big deal. Um, I don't know. They, whenever there has been creative editing, it's been kind of a big deal or it's been to bring attention right. to Right. Well, I mean, look scene. at Tower of Joy. Yeah. 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 Look at how creatively edited that scene was. It was so well, it was a very well done scene. And I would say that the majority of this episode had that quality to it. Every every single sequence of shots, I felt like meant something. The scene where Tyrion and Jon and Davos and Missandei are all walking up to Dragonstone through that long pathway, and they're all they're having a heated like d- conversation. They're talking. They're catching up. They're yeah. they're old pals, you know, from, uh. from before the war. <laughs> and but it meant something that they were taking the time to walk up to Dragonstone as we had watched Danny do 
two episodes prior. Exactly. Which was really nice too because one of my biggest, one of my, the things that has been like irking me this entire season so far um, is that it seems like, I mean, obviously they're trying to get through a lot really, really quickly, which is fine. I mean, they have to, but it feels very breezed over yes. in a lot of areas. And this is the first episode where they really kind of just took time. Like they took their time in the scenes that mattered. And mm-hmm. I think that that was a huge deal, especially with Fire and Ice meeting. I mean, yes. that was they a scene. Said it. They Melisandre said, said it. She was like, I, I have brought fire and ice together. And dun, I was like, dun, 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 dun. you know what? You did. She Honestly, did. like for all the crap that you have put us through, Mel, you did do that. And we can give you props. Oh, yeah. She gets, that. she gets some, yeah. She gets some candy. Yeah. <laughs> some candy. <laughs> Why candy? Like I don't know. It's from the Red God. This is for you. That's what the Red God <laughs> gives out to his favorite you get his favorite sh- subjects. And you get a candy. You get a red hot. It's, like, it's got to be like something <laughs> spicy. Like a red hot. He also sounds like Santa. Mmm. Mmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I think it's, it was a very um, uh, well-paced interesting episode it kept my attention the whole time uh there was not a scene that I didn't that I thought was unnecessary yeah it, and it was all memorable like in the all first two episodes all I can say is that all this happened somehow like we're eh. and now we're here it, there was nothing like memorable that really stood out and this this episode just like I can't pick uh, a highlight no, well, there were a no, lot of yeah. highlights. There were a lot of highlights. Like, I mean, yeah. yes, Elena Tyrell was amazing. Oh my God. But I honestly think that the conversation that John and Danny had was so intelligent and so well thought out. And the fact that they took the time, I mean, that was the first 20 minutes of the episode. Yeah. Was John and Danny basically just having a conversation about who they are as rulers. And, that, and you can totally see the fire versus the ice there, right? Like, John yeah. is cold and calculating. Ice Daenerys cold is the entire fiery, time. fiery, and she's, she believes that she is number one, you know? And, it, and it's really interesting that she made the speech for herself. You know, when she says, uh, I had faith in myself, in Daenerys Targaryen, she is saying those words there coming out of her mouth, whereas Davos speaks for John. Yeah. 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 Which, I mean, Davos. I have no problem with, because give Davos all the lines. Oh, of please. course, of course. <laughs> Wait, Please. do you like Davos? I did you not know? I, I no, I don't like him at all. Do you all. know which character that is? Who? I Who can't even keep this going. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's too hard. hard for me. It's too hard for me. I love him. I love him too much. The fact so that much. he got so like he said so much in this episode, and maybe he took it a little bit too far, but I think that he is just so wonderful. Just <laughs> so good, so pure. So pure, so, so nice pure. and kind <laughs> and good. Oh yeah. I'm so scared for him. <laughs> Anybody I, good and pure in this show? Like, I think it'll be. I think Granddaddy Davos will be okay. I think Grandpappy Davos. Grandpappy Davos. Grandpappy Davos will be fine because they've killed off all of the other characters like him. Like he is like the only nice older gentleman. He's the only in the old show man anymore. So I really think that he he'll stay. I think that Davos is is wise enough and wily enough. Yeah. I mean, he's a freaking smuggler. Like. The man can survive. I don't. I'm not worried for him. I don't think that he has any. I don't think once the war is over, I think that he wants to go back to his old life, and have nothing to do with this anymore. I think yeah. that he has no desire to sit on the Iron Throne. Oh no, no he has no desire sure to be a Zora High, which is why I think he's a Zora High. Like oh. he has no reason to be in this war except that he's found himself there. You know, yeah. he's found himself as the right hand man of the King in the North somehow. The King in the North and his right hand man. You have to make a Hamilton reference every, every single episode. time. <laughs> no, I, 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 I not. I'm okay with it. Okay, I, good. I'm not, I will never complain. I that's good because it's gonna this happen. This is my shot, and I'm not I'm not throwing away my shot. <laughs> that was an admittedly that was a bad one. <sighs> Continuing. <laughs> I have nothing else to say. <laughs> It has been every episode this season. I've made a, I've made a, rep, a Hamilton yeah, reference, but I'm not um, complaining. Um, I'm not complaining about it. But I, I like overall, this episode was exactly what we needed, and really and, strong. And like you said, there was not a moment that I didn't want to like leave the room. And sometimes yeah. there are points like I mean, I was worried through the whole Cersei torture scene. I was really 
worried that she was just going to have the mountain do something yeah. awful to Alaria Sand or Tyene or, you know, awful, just unspeakable, horrible things. I was, my, my whole body was very tense during that entire oh God, scene. Yeah. And when she just chose to do exactly what Alaria Sand did to Marcella, oh man, chills. I got chills. Ch- chills and like sympathy for the Sand Snakes and for Alaria that I never thought I would have. Like, I feel like... Sympathy for the Sand Snakes... I- Needs to be the crown of this season, I think. Like, I never it's thought such an achievement. I would How feel they... that way. No, I never did. I was like, I will feel, I, I don't care what happens. To that I was, j- all right. So, like, when Joffrey died, I rewatched his scene, like, three times because it was so, it was satisfying. Like, I was like, yes, this guy's a monster. I thought it was going to be kind of like that with the Sand Snakes. I was like, as soon as they're gone, it's just going to be great. Like, everything's going to be, all will be well in the world of watching Game of Thrones <laughs> because I hate the Sand Snakes. They need to be out. And now I'm just upset like that was that was horrible to watch but also poetically beautiful amazing yeah Yeah. and and, you know it makes me really sad because doran never stood a chance oh in this war clearly in this game of thrones well we saw the island when they showed it the the only people living there are like the sand snakes and two other people like there's very not populated no one lives in doran it's just the sand snakes it's just that and but but i will say i mean props to the actresses uh, yes. Indira Varma, who played Ilaria Sand, didn't have a line in that episode and stole yeah. the scene. Oh God, that's right. She didn't she, have any lines. Mm-mm. She had a she muffled was one, but bound. I mean, she was her mouth was bound. She couldn't talk, and I think that she was freaking incredible. That I, was some facial that, acting. Yeah, it was. It was heartbreaking. It I was really, really felt for her. I, I felt for her, and and Cersei is horny as ever. So it's so bad. It's so, I, I don't know what's worse, actually, seeing the scene with her and the Sand Snakes or, and, like, what she did to them or seeing her immediately turn around. My, my problem with that is that I really wanted to see her, like, wipe off more of the lipstick first because I'm real worried for Jamie's, like, downstairs <laughs> situation. For Jamie's business. Well, I'm real worried about it. I mean, yeah, it takes hours or days, so we shall see how it, I, I have a feeling that Jamie will be fine. I'm sure it's fine, but um, like he's a little he's got a lot more to deal with now than potentially being poisoned. True. Um, he has to go and tell Cersei <laughs> that he knows who killed their child and it was not their brother. Yeah. Uh, that's a really fun topic. Which I have a theory too about that, mm. um, for what that's going to mean for Jamie potentially becoming Queen Slayer. Okay. Rather than I think that's going to play into him being willing to listen to Tyrion. I agree. Actually, yeah. I wrote that down. I said, you know, now that Jamie knows the truth, that Jamie knows that Elena Tyrell, may she rest in peace. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Raise a glass. Jamie knows the truth about who killed his child. It's not Tyrion. And yeah. Tyrion and Tyrion never made it clear to Jamie that he was like, no, it wasn't me. No. He sort of was like, maybe. I don't know. Was it me? I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Because <laughs> um, it was easier that way. Yeah. It yeah. was easier to say goodbye to his brother at the end of season four. Gosh, yeah. Season four. Yeah, at the end of season four, it's easier to say goodbye to his brother and have Jamie hate him yeah. than to have Jamie wonder what could have been. That's true. And I, I think, I mean, as much as, as amazing as the Stark reunions have been and still will be, um, I think that the Jamie and Tyrion reunion is the one I'm probably most looking forward to at this point. I would, um, I would agree, actually, very, very much so, because they are two that have duked it out in a way they love each... You can tell how much they love each other yeah. and how much they care about each other, especially with Jamie. I mean, Jamie and one... And we've said this before, Jamie is one of the most interesting, if not the most interesting character that Game of Thrones has put out because of the archetypal hero's journey and, you know, all the 180s of his personality. Mm-hmm. He's done a lot of messed up things. And he's grown a lot. And he, but he's grown a lot. Well, the way he handled Lady Tyrell, like what happened with her, I mean, he, the fact that he didn't stab her at the end of that scene. Yes. I thought, and the fact that he he advocated for her being like, we're going to give her a peaceful way to go, basically. Yeah. That's when a When Cersei difference. wanted to oh, rip her to rip shreds. Rip her to shreds. Oh. Or have the mountain rip her to shreds. Or do so God, many things. God, unspeakable Ugh. things to her. Jamie would put his foot down and he yeah. said no. That also says something about Jamie and Cersei's relationship that she can still listen to him. Yeah. But I also think that is going to be the thorn in her side. Oh. Uh, is that Jamie oh. now knows and has seen how Cersei reacts to false information. Yeah. And Tyrion, 
may not be fighting on the we, we don't know who's gonna win this battle it might not even matter at the end of the day but yeah. if Jamie and Tyrion can sort of get on the same level again Jamie has Bronn on his side and yeah. Bronn might not want to fight Tyrion yeah I don't know that he would and I don't know that Bronn matters that much in the scheme of things like Jamie could be like oh you don't want to fight him fine and slice his neck, but I I, I yeah. don't think that will happen. I don't think so either. I I think, I think with how much Jamie's changed throughout the seasons, I I would see him now more willing to listen to like you know input from especially from Tyrion. Who I mean, we we know that he's a good hand to the queen, mm-hmm. but this episode, oh my god, like he he proved himself in ways that we haven't really gotten to see in a while, like since last season, I guess. But I mean. He convinced Danny to help John. Yes, but also he convinced his attack on Castle Rock didn't quite land. His attack on King's Landing didn't quite land. He hasn't True. had he's had a kind of bumpy road as the hand. In he's terms so of what he's words. doing um in Dragonstone with the people that he is around, mm-hmm. he's very good at close quarters. That's what t- I'm saying. Chatting. Though. Like talking. Tyrion can talk his way through anything. That's, that's what I'm saying, though. Yes. Is as soon as he gets reunited with Jaime and with Bran, I feel like... Bran. Ja- or Bran, yeah. Sorry. Bran, I mean, hey, Bran, I doubt Raisin Bran. Uh, <laughs> favorite older person cereal. Uh, <laughs> Where do you go? <laughs> <laughs> like, honestly. I got it's a, a different realm. It's... Yeah. Dark and full of cereal. <laughs> anyway, there's a lot of brands. There's Bran, Braun, uh, Benjamin. <laughs> In case you couldn't tell, we're you tired. Can, yeah, we're real tired, you guys. <laughs> okay. Oh my god, so that episode we... took it out of us. <laughs> Okay. So much happened. So, I agree. Tyrion and Jamie. I think that's going to be a really interesting uh, reunification. Cersei's not going to be too pleased to see him, but I no. also think that that's sort of going to lead Jamie to be the Valonqar. I do believe that Jamie will be the one that kills Cersei. I, I don't think that it can go any other way than that. I also think just title-wise, I mean, like, I saw this thrown around the internet that he he's uh, on the internet. Oh, um, the internet. <laughs> you know it? Oh, um, the internet. <laughs> do you, have you heard of it? Mm, the old internet. Um, <laughs> the old. <laughs> the old internet. <laughs> um, but I totally, hold on one second. <laughs> It was going so well. Um, oh yeah, okay. Heard it thrown around. Has uh, it been going well? Though? It's been going as well as it can. <laughs> it's like the army on um, High Garden. It they fought as well as as well as they could we for being Tyrells. Well. <laughs> for being Tyrells, and we're and talking being full of drinking, full of wine, and, and pretty gardens. They're so and roses. relaxed. Yeah, they're so relaxed there. All the time. It's the dream to to go to High Garden. Not anymore, but you Not know. anymore for sure. Like yeah. that's yeah, that's bad territory now. Um yeah. but uh oh yeah. Uh so Jamie <laughs> Jamie Okay, here's the thing with this season is that it's very heavy on reflecting on the past and um I mean as as Littlefinger brought up and we'll talk about this, um Everything that happens will be something you've seen before. And we've yes. already seen that established in this season. Yes. Um, this season has been very heavy on themes. Um, I mean, we had it... So sh- heavy on themes. So oh heavy themes. And, and that the main theme is the past. Looking to the past. So, I mean, Jamie being Kingslayer, I think he'll absolutely be Queenslayer next. I think that's, that is in, uh, that's going to happen for him. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I completely agree. we I completely agree, and I, and I think that it's it's a good um, way to end Jamie's story. Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, to have him sort of come full circle, kill the king, kill the queen, but be but do it for the people. He and Euron yeah. have a conversation about you know the people and how much they kind of suck. Actually, it's not a very yeah. nice conversation, but Jamie is very aware of the people in a way that I think that's why you know they have Varys talk about it. Yeah, there are people in this game. In in the there are players in the game that think about the people that are not playing the game, and those are the people that you need to listen to and watch out for. Cersei's not thinking about the plebeians, right? No. She's not thinking about the lower cast. No, she, never. she's not. She never will. Jamie is, and I think that that's what sort of sets him apart a little bit. And and it's interesting to watch because like, he has a soul, and she just doesn't anymore. And she literally killed 
uh, so many people when she blew up the Sept of Baylor. It's not even... It's like, insane. Like... Oh my god. <laughs> that was mass murder. Incredible. Mass though. murder. Cersei, yeah. Cersei Lannister committed. So, uh, yeah. So, anyway, continuing on though, the, the idea of themes. Everything comes full circle, right? As mm-hmm. you said before, Littlefinger states in this episode that everything is everything happening is something that has already been done or been seen before. In Layman's terms, basically, history is repeating itself. Mm-hmm. And all these characters are slowly begin beginning to learn that or having or are having it explicitly stated to their faces and yeah. trying to understand it. Like even in this episode we saw Cersei repeat you know, what Ilaria Sand did exactly on a much more manipulative scale, you know, it was a lot more intense what she put Ilaria Sand through. However, it's the exact same way that, you know, she got rid of Marcella. Um, and Elena Tyrell died the exact same way that she orchestrated Joffrey's murder. Right. Albeit with less throat grasping and choking, but it was still, it was still there. So right. there was even a little hearkening back to, um, season one when Ned and Ro- I think so when, when Ned and Robert, uh, first meet in episode one mm. or not first meet, but first meet up, um, there's kind of a tense moment and then a, a break, like yes. they, you know, start laughing and they embrace, um, that kind of happened with Tyrion and John in this episode. Absolutely. There was a little not, uh, that happened last episode with, um, the reflection back on San on, uh, not Sansa, Arya when she sees hot pie, what we think and Nymeria, and Nymeria yep. when she says, that's not you that was a direct reflection of season one so everything is very much like they're they're, they're not being it secretive they're about it back and and i think i think the the main goal that they're going for here is the only way to move forward the only way to like win the war is to learn from past mistakes so that they're not remade this is something that literally like everybody on a daily basis in life like regularly struggles with and it's one of the main themes of game of thrones that you can sort of see Mm-hmm. In our own in our own daily lives, like you know, there's no White Walkers in our life, but like this is something that we can all sort of like don't make your don't relive your past, right? Like right, exactly. And I mean, if you look at uh, if you look at John, you look at Danny too. They're both they've not been secret in the show about the fact that these two are very much fighting the past, like um, in a in a good way. I mean, Danny has been worn ha, was worn by Tyrion and, and multiple no, not even just Tyrion um was worn multiple times. Don't become your father. Like yes. you are showing tendencies to become your father. Don't do it. They've been very very much you know sending that home if that's the right phrase uh, <laughs> that she is trying to not be that way. She's trying not to become She's not the, trying the to emulate queen. her dad. Right. But then also there was a point brought up several times with John where Sansa kept saying where point he he specifically said people keep saying like don't make the mistakes your father made. Mm-hmm. And he does all of the things that people tell him not to do because they were what they, you know, connect with Ned's yeah. end. Right. So I think that's kind of interesting actually that John almost seems to be maybe fighting that or maybe learning from mistakes of the past and repeating them and doing them better doing, like, I don't really doing know. them differently he's, right. he's learning from his mistakes in a way that i think some characters might not be right um, right I, I think that it's also one of the reasons that um bran is fixated so much on the past you know um he truly believes that if he can find all the answers everything will be okay but by meddling in time it's gotten him into deeper trouble. It's it's started the vicious cycle. Like it's a total. It's a total. Game of Thrones is just literally the epitome of a vicious cycle, yeah. right? If, especially if we are believing and like holding to the fact that this is all Bran's fault. Yeah. That that he is the reason that the mad the Mad King went mad. He is the voice that the Mad King was hearing. Um, all he wants to do is all Bran wants to do is be able to relay and understand the information that he has in this storage locker that is full of infinite knowledge but he has no guide to help him he has nobody to be like okay go this direction and then turn left and then turn left again and then turn right and then you know open this door and go he has no one he has this whole maze to figure out by himself and that's also probably why he has such difficulty connecting with people right and it makes him dangerous it does. It makes him really dangerous. And volatile. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and I saw uh, a lot of... Bran got a lot of flack this episode for the yeah. way that he acted. Clearly, okay, so Bran showed up in Winterfell. It was awesome. <laughs> it, oh, it, it was... was, it was wonderful. It was I amazing mean, just to see Sansa's reaction. I mean, like, for the, this poor now woman has been through so much and yep. to see her see that her one of her youngest brothers is still alive and to see her kind of break a little bit and like cry I mean that was kind of a kind of a nice moment because the way that 
you see the Starks now. I mean, they've been through so much that they're they're kind of stone cold. And, like, they are. you can't blame them. Like, they've had to be. That's survival. But it was nice to see her kind of um, have this tender moment and and kind of break down when she saw him. I mean, that's I, what I thought. I agree. It, it, you allow... It's... I think it gave Sansa, Sansa a little bit of hope. Yes. Like, she was like, oh my god, you're not dead. Everybody right. has thought Bran has been dead this whole time. They thought he was burned alive in season one by Theon. Like, this is... That's right. Basically, Bran and Rickon... Everybody, apparently, Rickon... They found out Rickon was okay. But Bran, he was a cripple. Right. You know, who escaped... Who got burned alive or escaped into the woods. But he still is a cripple. He has... He cannot move his legs. He probably everybody thought that he died. Sansa had come to terms, had accepted the fact. She had she had gone to, through the phases of acceptance and all through the, all the stages of grief, you know. And now she gets her brother back. Yeah. Um. And and I think that there's a lot of emotion there, and there's a lot to unpack. And P- Bran Coughlack for you know the way that he acted, but I I think I wholeheartedly agree that you should not trigger your abused sister. Um. Mm-hmm. But I also don't think that the I think that his sentiment was there. I think that you have to remember, Bran did not sign up for any of this. No, he didn't. And I will also say to you, we don't know what else he has been delving into, mm-hmm. like, past-wise. Like, we, I mean, it doesn't even really matter how much time has passed in the show. It more matters how much he's, how deep he's gone into yes. being the Three-Eyed Raven. Because, um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we only know how far we only know what like we've seen with him going back in the past we haven't we don't know how far back and and how much he's been thinking about it in the time since we last saw him right we have no Um, idea what he's seen since then we don't know like how much does bran know well that's the thing too is like he saw her wedding i mean what else has he seen like how far back has he has he gone how much has he seen from you know the recent past that kind of filled him in on what's happened in the show so far pretty much but also like I, I don't, yeah, that's it. <laughs> no, I, I, I think it's really interesting, and I think it's going to come out yeah. more as Bran sort of gets used to life in Winterfell. I don't know if he's going to stay. He said that he doesn't want to be the king of the North. He has, the king of the North. He has no desire to no. be lord of Winterfell. Um, but I, I, I'm interested to see what's going to happen and how Sansa is going to deal with Bran from now on because yeah. clearly, I mean, the way that he talk to her and the way that he brought up you know the the white wedding is what it's called which is just freaking awful oh, horrible. um I, I guess my my two cents on you know his the way that he reacted and the way his you know, how he seemed so dead and so just like dead eyes and very yeah. mon- monotonous voice whereas Sansa was full of emotion I think that um Bran hasn't been around people in how many years right like, the only people he's been around is the Children of the Forest and the Three-Eyed Raven. You, you only need to, like, look at him to see that he has gone through some stuff. Mira learned how to talk and act around Bran because she's his protector. She is the mm-hmm. only one that can keep him alive. But Sansa hasn't seen her brother, like I said, in how long. He was right. in a coma when she left for King's Landing. Bran, on the other hand, has, like you said, seen everything. He has mm-hmm. seen what Sansa has been through. He knows how she felt. Maybe not how she felt, but he could see it. However he saw it, he knows what she was feeling and went through in that moment. And that was the probably lowest moment of her life. It was yeah. the moment she was being violated and assaulted. And she felt so... And being... And someone was watching. Right. You know? It wasn't just at the expense of her. And so that was... to And so maybe he, Bran, on some level was trying to be like, you know, you weren't alone. I was there for you. Right. But this is a show written by two men. Yeah. So you're not going to get very far with it. You're not going to get what you want. And and so I think that the sentiment for Bran was there. It was just not executed well. I don't think that he's that much of a dick. I just can't believe that Bran has gone from when he talked to the Three-Eyed Raven, you know, about seeing his Lyanna and seeing his young young Ned. He seemed so alive, and he's really lost the light in his eyes over this past however long it's been since the Three-Eyed Raven died, since Hodor died, you know, yeah. and, and so clearly he's aged, but I want him to sort of realize that he's with his family again, and maybe everything will be okay, but that for now, he's home. I don't really know how, okay, this is gonna, this might sound kind of cold, but I don't really know how much home means to him anymore. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. I mean, I really, I really don't, it's, and I'm not saying that because... I don't want to see him kind of be like, oh, right, this is home. Like, I remember who I am, but... 
<laughs> poke myself in the eye there. <laughs> you got uh, this. Uh-huh. <laughs> You're the one-eyed raven now. <laughs> That's what I've always wanted to be. It's true. Uh, I mean, it's going to sound really hippy-dippy and like very like, uh, I don't know, it's going to sound, like I said, it's going to sound kind of hippy-dippy, but I feel like once you've gotten the ability to kind of like transcend all of time and like everything, I feel like pl- like any one place, even if it's your home, doesn't really mean that much anymore because you've seen like... Mm-hmm you've seen that place before it was your home. Like, you've seen that place long before it was your home, probably. Like, yeah. we don't, again, we don't know how far back he's gone. He knows things now about his family that nobody else knows except Ned, and Ned's not talking to anyone. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I guess my only thing about not knowing as far as he's gone is we can only harken back to what the OG Three-Eyed Raven said, you know, if it's if you go too far, you'll drown. And that's what I'm Grant kind of hasn't happens. drowned yet. Well, or has he? Has he completely lost his mind and is just totally not Brandon Stark anymore? Is he just the Three-Eyed Raven now? Maybe. I mean, because even the, if you look at the Three-Eyed Raven, the Three-Eyed Raven in his tone and like the way he talked to Bran, he didn't sound deadened inside. Mm-mm. Like he sounded like a person. I mean, yes. he still said Bran doesn't, and Bran has not been at it as long as the Three-Eyed mm-hmm. Raven or the former Three-Eyed Raven has been. Right. Um, I think he showed. I think that it might be his way of coping. I mean, he was thrown into this situation. You know, we've seen, we've actually seen a lot of interesting like mental health stuff on the show. Like mm-hmm. we saw um, Theon. Everybody, a lot of people accused him of being a coward. Where really he had a very severe PTSD, PTSD reaction. reaction. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> Psychology buddies. Oh. Um, but he had a PTSD reaction. Bran, this might be. A, I mean, maybe he's drowning a little bit, which I personally think he is. I think I think he's it's kind too of much giving for him. up. It's too information much information overload. Information overload, and also just giving up like earthliness mm-hmm. for like being mm-hmm. this new kind of being. It just um, all that doesn't matter. Exactly. The material things do not matter. Doesn't matter, and I think when you have access to all that, you need to kind of let go, maybe, of like yeah. who you're close to, and that's sad. But and he I already think maybe has, he has, and so now it's who now they have to let go of him. Yeah. But they just got him back. I know, and that's what's hard. Is like, I th- and I think he still loves them. I just think it's in a different way. I don't think he, they're. I don't know if they're going to get the satisfaction of their little brother being back. No, um, I there, think there they, is, there's not that same satisfaction. You, no. got, you got Sansa very much went experienced that. She's like, oh my god, yeah. am I the only sane one of my siblings left? Like when Arya shows right. up, Sansa's oh. just going to be like, oh my. god. You were what? You were people's faces? They've never been more different. No, never. I mean, they, they never got along initially. Like, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm hoping that Arya just shows up and quick kills Peter Baelish and it's done. I have a, I have a theory about that. Ooh. I don't think it. she, I don't want her to be the one who kills him. Okay. I really want it to be Sansa and I have more reason now for wanting it rather than just like, you know, her own revenge. Um... I could not stop thinking about Littlefinger's scene in this episode. I have never, I have not thought about Littlefinger as much as I have in this episode, mm. um, or uh, in any season as I ha- as much as I did in this episode. If that makes sense. Totally. Um, and I was just totally fixated on what he said, on his quote about um, everything that you'll see has happened before. You've seen it before. Um, every possible reality is going on at once. He became like schrodinger like very very quickly and it was it was weird like we know he's kind of had this philosophy and we've kind of been led into it a little bit um but it stood out to me because right now in the show i feel like we have the ones who are fighting and the ones who know things yes um and absolutely I, yeah. yeah and i feel like it's strange because i think he gives this facade of knowing things where really i think he's actually more of a pawn who needs to die at the hands of someone whose life he's kind of screwed up to put it's things awesome. back. It's awesome. exactly <laughs> <coughs> I'm all for Sansa murdering yes. Littlefinger. Well, and I th- I think that this season kind of has set or that up. Or protecting herself and having, somehow killing him. Yes. yes. Well, exactly. And it would be symbolic because if you look at why all of this started, it, Littlefinger it's was the... Fault. It's his fault. I mean, we can we can blame Bran on it. And Bran, I mean, for a lot of this, I, would, I really like the idea that he made the Mad King mad. I love that. But if we're talking about the events that started when Game of Thrones started with Ned Stark dying, unless Bran had something to do with Littlefinger's upbringing and driving him to do what he did with, by basically messing with the Stark family, um, which I would think, I would like that. At That'd be point, really interesting. At this point, I will believe that Bran is... The father of chaos, right? Yeah, like, yeah. He is he is Loki. He is the bringer of chaos. He has right. done all of it accidentally. He does not mean to. He is, but he right. it is his all. 
Like I would, that is, that would be the best ending to this show for me. I completely agree. And I actually think it's really interesting that in this episode, they had a scene with Littlefinger saying his whole bit about um, everything we've seen before will happen again. And then they immediately showed Bran pretty much saying the same thing. Because here's what I thought, here's what I thought was interesting about that is that I think they're very similar in that they both seem to have the same philosophy of using the past to learn from. Mm -hmm. But the difference here is that Bran has the sight and Peter doesn't. Like, it's almost like Peter's operating blindly, just like, this is my belief, whereas Bran has the tools to actually go back in the past and And mess around. And learn around and learn about it and mess around. Right. Mess everything up. Exactly. So (laughs) they've both shaped events. Yes. Like, Bran and Peter have both shaped events. But I think that um, my my whole final theory on, on... Peter Baelish and on Little Finger. Well, and on Little Finger is the same person, but my whole theory on Little Finger. Peter Peter Baelish, aka Little Finger. AKA, exactly. Um, you all know. Um, <laughs> I think his purpose now in the show. I think the only remaining purpose because trust me, I dug and dug and dug. I tried finding what his greater purpose might be. Maybe he's he's kind of like a red priest. Like maybe he has that kind of belief because he and and uh, Melisandre kind of have similar scene, scenes in this episode where mm. they're both this all knowing like yeah, but omnipotent I think, sort of omnipotent. Yeah. omnipotent. Yeah, I think that Peter Baelish's biggest role in Game of Thrones now is that he set off this this chain of events. I think he needs to end it by being murdered by the person, the one person who reflects whose life he messed up from the beginning, which is Catelyn's. Yes. And that is Sansa. That is Sansa. Sansa mirrors Catelyn. Right. Exactly. This and that's hair, the past coming back. And even in this episode, her hairstyle was how yes. Catelyn styled her hair in this in the first few seasons. It exactly. was very hearkening back to Catelyn. Catelyn has been around a lot this season. Yeah. Mostly people have been speaking about her. and But in flashbacks, you know, she's been shown a lot. She's around. So even though, she's they, around. Like, even though they didn't do Lady Stoneheart... It feels like Catelyn is not quite dead. I think Sansa will be Lady Stone. I think we talked about this a couple episodes ago, but I think that Sansa's going to take up the Lady Stone. Because I said that was Arya, but it sort of seems that her daughters are instead Lady Stoneheart. As opposed to just one person being Lady Stoneheart. The idea, the vehicle of vengeance, is that the Stark girls can carry it out themselves. Exactly, yeah. No, I, yeah, I completely agree, and I would love it to be Sansa, just because if you look back in a little Fingers past, it's all about, like, he loves Catelyn. Everything he did, like, how did he, I mean, he said it, oh, it's so, so nasty. nasty. He's so nasty. He's so nasty. He's the reason Ned Stark died. He manipulated um, Liza He's the reason into, Liza is insane. He's the reason Liza was insane and is dead. Um, He's the reason... He pushed Liza out of the moon. He pushed door. her through a <laughs> hole. Like, it's horrible. Um, He is the reason why, uh, I mean, he got really nervous when Sansa, when the maester said that they have records of every of every note that every raven has brought to Winterfell yeah. because the note that Liza was manipulated into writing uh, that kind of set off the chain of events by Littlefinger is probably there. And everything is there. If Littlefinger yeah. gets his hand on that, I think he could find some secrets that... Oh, yeah. I think that that would elongate his stay on the show. Mm-hmm. My big question for Peter Baelish is why, what, what is he now? Why does he matter? Who, what is his character now that he has helped win Winterfell back from the North? That's like what I the, think. For the Starks. That's what I think he is. He's the restorer of right. balance. And to restore balance, the balance that he threw off, Sansa needs to murder him. Because he the image be of Catelyn needs to kill him. Yes. That's what I think. And, and Lady Stoneheart can't do it. Why not the spitting image of her, you know? Exactly. I, I think that's a really excellent theory. And... It, it just, once again, it just brings it all full circle. It's this yeah. whole idea of history repeating itself, but having slight changes that... Improvements. Im- that improve <laughs> the outcomes, yeah. basically. So I I think that that's fascinating. And my I truly do hope that Sansa is the one yes. to drive the dagger, his dagger, through his heart. Hopefully it's in the next episode, because just, like, let's get rid of him. Oh, yeah. No I mean, more screen time. Like, literally, he was the worst part of the episode. He really But the was. most interesting part, on the, like, the words he was saying were really interesting, but that's, he sucks. That's the thing, is, like, I really didn't want to be interested in this episode. I'm, like, done with him. I think everybody's done with him. He doesn't serve an interesting purpose no. anymore. I want to see, kind of, why he's still here in the season. I honestly think it's because he's going to be the restorer of balance. Like. I agree. I hope. I hope. I, I I wholeheartedly hope so. Yes. Yes. Well, if he dies, he dies. Like, and it'll be great. That you it'll know they'll do. You know they'll do a good job with it. That's oh, the yeah. thing. Like once Peter Baelish dies, I mean, Aiden Gillen has done a great he job. He has done amazing. amazing. 
making Peter so slimy. slimy. Yeah. Oh, oh, it's the second time we've done that tonight. Oh my God. Woo! Yes. Perfect. Roll. But um, <laughs> so speaking of death, let's switch gears again because we got to keep going with the episode. Got to keep course. this. Keep it going because this Game of Thrones we're talking about here. We retreated to not one but two castle sieges in the Queen's Justice. Indeed. We actually got to witness the sacking of Casterly Rock by the Unsullied, and unfortunately, House Tyrell finally fell. Didn't get to see as them. Jamie get took high to High Garden, just as Rob did in the Whispering Wood. Yeah. And I loved that call out. I just have to say, it shows like Jamie saying Rob's name and saying, yeah. yeah, just like Rob Stark did to me. It shows, again, how much he has grown and how much he's learned over the course of the show. We've been saying this whole episode, we have been real singing Jamie Lannister praises, and oh, I yeah. just want to, honestly, I want to keep going. Do it. I want to keep going. Lay it We've on been me. saying through this whole entire episode, the theme of the season is that history repeats itself, and we are going to sound like broken records. I think that's just going to be a continuation. We're going to repeat show. ourselves. If that's the case, my question is, will Jamie fall just as Rob did? I don't think so, because he seems to be learning from his mistakes. Rob won the battles, but lost the war. Yeah. Hopefully, Jamie has lost enough battles that his war, whoever he ends up fighting for, and I highly doubt it'll be Cersei, Mm-mm. will actually be won. I think so, yeah. I just think that... He's going to be one of the most important characters in the war to come. Even though the Queen of Thorns bumped, set, and spiked her way through that final scene with Jamie, he was the one that came out alive at the end. And as you said, the fact that he didn't plunge a dagger straight through her heart after she boasted about killing his son shows insane character growth. Oh, yeah. And it makes me glad they added him into Jeff- Joffrey's death scene in the show because he's not there in the books. Oh. At all. So I, it so it finally, it resonated with me. I was like, this is why they did that. Was for this scene. I did not know that. And wow, that was, that took some planning. Yes. Like that they, is, that shows me they planned that. I mean, maybe, I don't know. Good. No, Hopefully let's go did. with that. Yeah, because okay. that, that good on them at that point. Right? I mean, yeah, they laid that groundwork way early on. Yeah. Oh man. I want, to re-watch, years ago. I want to rewatch that scene, one, to see Jamie there, and two, because I just can't get enough of seeing Joffrey die. I'll be oh, honest. Like, you're a psychopath. You're a sociopath. A little Crazy bit. Person. Only with Joffrey. Because Joffrey's the worst. Joffrey is a monster. <laughs> seeing a monster get slain is okay. <laughs> I agree. I mean, it's the same thing with, with Ramsay. It's the same oh, thing with worst. Ollie. It's the same thing with all the bad characters that have been killed on this show. Yeah. Their deaths are glorious. Beautiful. And honestly, Horribly I will say, beautiful. as far as glorious death Deaths go, Elena Tyrell had one of the best. Oh, yeah. Because she was, after all is said and done, the most excellently written character. And she won. On the show. And she She oh, died, she but won. she won. Oh, she won. She, oh, oh, oh. She won, though. Oh, she won. And I think so much of her power has to do with the actress Diana Rigg. Yes. Um, I, what a queen. I understand why they killed off the Queen of Thorns at this point. It's past time. She'd be sort of an unhealthy shadow for Daenerys Targaryen, mm-hmm. like a someone hell-bent on revenge. Once again, the living embodiment of grief. And she's still wearing all black, you know? She is yeah, clearly... they all are. Yeah, they all are. She's clearly not coming out of this. Um, and now she's finally allowed peace. Not to mention, like you said, she won in her death scene. Oh, yeah. The the acting in that scene, both with Diana and Nicolas Costa-Valdo, like, they were phenomenal. Oh, they were incredible. That scene, yeah. yeah I have nothing else to say. I'm just, I they, love that Really, scene. I don't think we have to say anything else. They both have showed how Jamie, I mean, Nicolas Costa-Valdo, honestly, has just taken Jamie and given him something so much more interesting than, honestly, the books ever did. And, and uh, When it comes to Jamie, though... I've heard that in the books, I've heard he's way more interesting in the books. Would you say that he's grown more in the books or the show? I would say in the show. Okay. Completely. In the books, Jamie is a lot better. And in, oh. and I mean, but he does more um, noble things. Like he doesn't rape his sister. He doesn't sort of, and that might be maybe the only thing that they really take their liberties with unless, I mean, Jamie is at the, is at his son's death scene, like I said, mm-hmm. but He's he is a point of view character, so you really get to read through all of his actions, all of what he's what he's thinking of when he's doing, why he's doing making the tactical decisions that he's doing. Mm-hmm. So you really get to 
understand Jamie throughout the whole of the series. In the show, you don't know him like that. You're not in his head. So they really had to do a good job. If they mm-hmm. want to make him the hero of this show, they have got to make you want it. Yeah. And right now, I want it. I didn't want it two seasons ago. Oh. You know, but I think that, and that says something about him, the actor, the writing, and the freaking showrunners, I guess. Whatever. <laughs> 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 them two. Ugh, ugh, fine. Whatever. Fine. Um, um, but, yeah. Do you think, and again, like, just like the show is repeating itself, I'm going to repeat myself with this, but do you think uh, the reason he has been Kingslayer this whole time is so that he can be Queenslayer now? As a reflection of the past. In the show, yes. Okay. In the show, absolutely. I think that somehow, I don't know how they had this planned out from seven seasons or eight seasons. I kind of find it hard to believe a little bit that they had this whole thing planned out this well. I think that they got lucky with the way that Jamie's story played out. Yeah. And they are riding high on it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's my my two cents on Jamie Lannister. All right. Um, But in terms of Elena Tyrell, I'm okay with her being gone. Her story was done, and they wrapped it up quite properly. I wasn't mad that she died. I wasn't either. And, I mean, I, I will also say, just, like, from a personal or, or a character standpoint, I think she was probably ready to go. Yeah. Like, she, she was ready to go. She chugged that line, man. She, was, she downed that she fast. She was rearing. She downed that like a college freshman. Like, that was amazing. <laughs> college freshman sees his first shot of, <laughs> of rum. It's like, yeah, it's like, you uh, don't shoot rum. What are you doing? Like, <laughs> this you don't correct poison. <laughs> But she did it without even just breaking a sweat. Not even, she exactly. She was ready to go. She was ready to go, and man, she I think she knew it was coming for a long time. She was saving that morsel of information. She, she was, was keeping that close to the chest. It, oh, God. She came out on top, and I think that she, I think the reason that the, sh- the episode was called The Queen's Justice Is that. was because of her. Oh, uh, she, she was the one that got justice at the end. For because sure. Because let's be real, killing Joffrey was no sin, and, and she got to admit to her sins and die happily knowing that those words would haunt Jamie for the rest of his life. That's true. Yeah. And I think that that's why she won. Yeah, you know? I agree. Well, she even said she does what's necessary. Like she doesn't, she doesn't do like good or bad. She's Stannis she, Baratheon. She was who Stannis yeah. Baratheon was supposed to be. Oh. Just, just saying. Whatever. Interesting. I don't have to talk. We don't have to talk about Stannis. <laughs> but let's just take a moment of silence to appreciate the Queen of Thorns. Agreed. The incredible woman that was Elena Tyrell. A moment of silence, everybody. All right. That was good. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. The bummer of her and literally any remaining Tyrells dying is now that is that now their goal can be used to pay off the Lannister deaths. <laughs> um I'm not sure whose yeah. tactical decision it was to eradicate House Tyrell, be it Jamie or Cersei, but whoever did so has officially made the Iron Bank and the Lannisters besties. Because the Iron Bank was on my screen. Uh, so was Mycroft from uh, Sherlock, a.k.a. Mark Gaddis, who I, oh, yeah. I, I truly love. War is really good for banks. Banks really enjoy war because it means loans. Yeah. I'm not surprised that the Iron Bank has once again shown up. How that Tycho Nestoris, that's... Nestorus, that's his name. Tico Nestor- Nestorus, Tycho Nestorus, that's the character. I, I blocked those scenes out. So <laughs> I, I just, I just like, it was, I was like, oh, money situation. And I just blocked him out. I was like, this isn't helpful for me to. <laughs> I just thought it was really interesting that they're, they're finally, um, they're showing up again. It doesn't yeah. mean that we can just write off the Iron Bank, Bank of Bravos. Uh, this is their time to shine. They're about to get paid back by the Lannisters. So I have a feeling that they are going to be another ally for the Lannisters in this war. Yeah, um, yeah. So I don't think that this character is one that's going to go away anytime soon. So I would just say keep an eye on him. You see him, like, sort of grinning in the next episode. So um, He's just Mycroft. He's just, he's my, just he's always just Mycroft. Mycroft. <laughs> There's not even a question. Like, he's just always going to be Mycroft. You yeah, know? <laughs> totally. Plus, like, British actors. There are 12 of them. How, yeah. There are five settings for all of British TV and there are, like, three writers. I'm shocked David Tennant hasn't been in the show yet. I, I Maybe he has, like, as an extra somewhere. Like, so, he's got to be, right? Now it's time for a rewatch. Oh, my God, yes. IMDb <laughs> who? No, I'm going to go back and rewatch it. Make sure that David Tennant wasn't in. The Tennant in. search. I like it. The Tennant The Tennant search. search. All right. So, um, continuing on in this episode, 
Back in the Citadel. Back. Meanwhile, in the meanwhile, Citadel. Me- meanwhile. <laughs> it turns out Jora is doing a okay. Sam's gutsy act of healing paid off, and according to Archmaester Ebros, Jora is healthy enough to get the F out of the Citadel. Yeah. And back into Danny's good graces. Aww. He did. <laughs> yeah. He loves her so much. I mean, much. he did what she ordered him to do. He, he did. He got. He got better. And and I have to say that this scene might have been my like favorite little kernel in the whole episode. The whole, mm. this episode was so grandiose. There were sweeping statements, sweeping shots, crazy fights that went down. Great voiceovers. Great voiceovers. Oh Frickin my god. Tyrion. This scene was so simple. It was three men talking really kindly to each other. Yeah. And I just loved it. I thought that the so much of Game of Thrones is filled with spite and dripping with sarcasm, and there was no hidden meaning in anything that any of these men said. And the handshake that Jorah and Sam share was so poignant. Yeah, you're no, you're totally right. And it brought it back to like the individual too, because yeah. what we're watching right now is very much on a macro level. It it's, is. Yeah, like remember, we're. But these are the characters we've been watching since right. the, since the beginning. Like, we love them. They have to have these tiny conversations that don't really mean anything. Jorah has to clap. Jorah never thought he was going to touch a human being again. Right. You know, this is very. And although that's a small scale, that's not something huge in mm-hmm. the world. He believed that he was honestly he was never going to touch a human being again and so to touch sam and like clasp his hands like 50 points to hufflepuff man (laughs) man i i gotta say like that's just my jam (laughs) in fact hufflepuff just wins the house cup let's just give it to him (laughs) this is the one scene they gave hufflepuff to write and they were just like we're gonna make it really friendly Exactly. That is Sam. Sam is the uh, epitome of the Hufflepuff house. Sam is very I, much a Hufflepuff. I, yeah. I, I know they give him Gryffindor. People give him Gryffindor, but I'm well, like, you know, he's very. He's not that. He's brave, but only when it's absolutely required of him. I don't know. I would say, you know what? I think he's a Ravenclaw. I thought so too, but I also think he's a little too bumbling to be a Ravenclaw. I think he is the perfect embodiment. Of, look at Cedric Diggory. He was a freaking Hufflepuff. You know, like you get good, you like Ernie McMillan was a lovely Hufflepuff. You get good Hufflepuffs and they're sweet and support you. Like Hufflepuffs are exactly who you need. He's the one like, yes, he's writing the story. And that is a super Ravenclaw thing. But at the end of the day, Hufflepuffs are just good. They're inherently good people. And that is what Sam is. I agree. I also still think he's a Ravenclaw. He's a Hufflepuff, fine. He's a Hufflepuff, I like that. A Ravenpuff. He's a Ravenpuff. (laughs) He's... (laughs) He's a raven puff. <laughs> That's what Sam. That's what he is. Sam That's decided. Yep. Um, I think that. Uh, how much money do you bet, though, that there's going to be some critical information in those manuscripts? Oh, that 100%. he has to copy. Oh, uh, the, the that's way to that... help him win the freaking war. Oh you know? my god, the way that, that he was like, oh, you don't expect a reward, do you? Except it's hidden in the books. Just do your reading. Just read it Just all. Just do Sam. your homework. Do Just your read. job. Just read. Basically, anything can be solved by reading. Seriously. In in Westeros. He also like his. Okay, as soon as he said. They were like, how did, how did you cure him? And he just goes, I read the instructions. And I followed And them. I did it. And I followed them. I followed them. I was like, you know, if everybody in this world did exactldy that, maybe we wouldn't be in this situation. There wouldn't maybe be just that read, many YouTube, attention. There wouldn't be that many YouTube tutorials, my God. There wouldn't be. <laughs> Pinterest would be a non-starter. That would not be. <laughs> Everything would be out of business. Never mind. That's, that's a really true. bad idea. It's <laughs> Sorry, we shouldn't read instructions. We got it wrong. <laughs> Never... We build the IKEA furniture the way we want it. IKEA furniture the way we want to build it, okay? You get a bookshelf, you build a table. It's all just about being creative in the end of the day. Exactly. Yes. But except for Sam. Sam gets it done, solves any problem by reading. He does. He really does. He's going to save the world by reading a damn book. Like, I love it. It's great. I'm ready for it. I, I'm sorry. I'm ready because he's changed so much and he's come into his own and he's freaking brave. I don't even think that he's changed. I think that he's just become a stronger person. Yeah. Like a stronger at like personification of Sam. I don't think that Sam at his core has really changed. That's that true. Much. It's more, he's in a place where he can thrive. He's yes. in a place where he can, he can show his bravery in a way that the environment allows. The Night's basically. Watch did not allow him to be oh, no. as brave as he wanted to be. No. Now he's surrounded by books. He can do anything. He can do anything. Yeah. That's a and that's the that's the truth of life, okay? Right. Reading there. Rainbow. 
Um, but thank God Jorah is heading toward Dragonstone. Yes. Because it really seems like Danny is severely lacking in a military commander, given yeah. the fact that her last two attempts to attack the rest of the Seven Kingdoms have both failed pretty Very quickly. miserably. More than half her Greyjoy army was destroyed. Yara was taken prisoner. Mm -hmm. Alaria and her children were killed. Mm -hmm. Theon is alive, but he's yeah. alive and as well as can be considered, given what happened. And exactly. Grey Worm and his unsullied army are trapped on Casterly Rock, about to face off with Euron and his gaggle of fun-loving friends. And if they survive that, they get to march all the way across Westeros oh, God. to be reunited with Daenerys. Luckily, though, Jorah is an extremely skilled military technician. Tactician, the only question, he's just not at Dragonstone yet. Right. So she can't, she doesn't have his guidance. That is, yeah, no, that's a good point. And he, him and Tyrion together with Danny, I think, I think it's going to be exactly what she needs to, like, build her up to. Because well, he Tyrion, was always, you know. Jorah, Tyrion, Tyrion yeah. I would say Jorah brought out the best in Tyrion, and Tyrion brought out the best in Jorah, so yeah. hopefully... It meshes. That was one of the best buddies, buddy cop, buddy romances in Game of Thrones. So good. Oh my god, it was so good. It was the crowning glory of season five. It, it really was. That was a good little... Yeah, their little adventures across the sea were beautiful. They fought zombies... It was amazing. They just did some stuff. They did some they stuff. They did some... They got stuff done. They got stuff done, and now they're gonna... Now they're gonna do more stuff. This Hopefully. Is, this is the description of next episodes to come. Stuff is gonna happen. They're gonna talk about stuff. They're gonna get stuff done. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, but I'm, I'm excited. I hope that they give us that. They're just really pushing all these characters together. So yes. many characters are being brought together that, you know, so I, I have a feeling that Jorah's going to get to Dragonstone pretty quickly. I think so, too. Um, I'm not worried. I'm a little worried. I, I'm, I mean, you know, as you know, worried as I can be. <laughs> is there a way that he can... Okay, when... Bran, however, he gets the information to John that John is a Targaryen, which like, and I know we're gonna talk about this. They just they they shove that in our face. I wonder if John is a Targaryen. Oh my god, could he be? No, oh, no, <laughs> that hasn't been brought up at all. Um, yeah, they they just oh my god, like they they could have glanced at the camera like every single time they said like I'm not a Stark. Looks at the camera. Office, like, office. style. Office Jim Halpert. Style. Jim Halpert. Style. <laughs> um, but I wonder if there's any way that Jorah arriving at Dragonstone at the same time the information that uh, John as a Targaryen arrives, I wonder if that will do any good. Like, just those two things arriving at the same time. So I guess I'm curious to see, just in Jorah's history, what you think he could kind of... Could he, like, vouch for that? Like... For John being a Targaryen? Yeah. Um... No. <laughs> Okay. Probably not. Because it does seem like they're going to get there at the same time. And maybe that's just like all of the necessary pieces of information to build Danny up are going to converge I think, at the same time. I think basically it's just going to give Danny what she, like Danny okay, the, yeah. I think the arrival of that information and Jorah, hopefully at the same time, it's just going to give Danny the light that she needs to sort of fight through this first really tough that she's lost its first battle I mean, yeah so she needs to come back right now all she can do is sort of turn turn to john uh and davos but you know it's gonna be a little difficult to to get them on her side hopefully i mean i doubt right. it i doubt it she already gave them the dragon stone that they needed right but at this point after all her trumpeting about being the rightful ruler of the seven kingdoms she has to prove to them that she is can be trusted well, and that she can change course now that her and greatest listen. assets, and listen, now that her greatest assets basically, and I'm, I think she still thinks her greatest assets are her dragons. They're not. Right now they are. Right. Well, right. They, we have, we have only seen them wreck in battle. They are her trump card. True, but I don't think she's going to win anything with them. I think I, I think, think she's she, going to win she, one battle, but I don't know if she'll win the war. No, because she doesn't, that's, I mean, Ver, I think it was Varys who said this, or maybe Tyrion. Um, she doesn't want to do that. She doesn't want to pillage and, and destroy half the city to own it. She's not a conqueror. It. She's not, I she, think she, she is a conqueror. I don't think she's a... She doesn't want to be an, a vicious conqueror. Right. She wants to be... What was it? She's not a monarch. She's a revolutionary is what Cersei said. Okay. I see that as a positive thing. Yeah. 
Okay, I don't yeah. see that as a negative thing. Just because she doesn't know the way that Westeros works doesn't mean that she can't be the leader. Yeah, that's true. But she needs to listen and learn. She needs to prove that she's not stuck in her ways. She went out of her way to ask forgiveness from Jon for the actions of her house, and I don't think that mm-hmm. she would have done that a few years ago. She called Tyrion out on being a little faker, and he copped to it. <laughs> yeah. You know, she might not have done that to a... For, she's always been fiery. She's incredible. But the problem is she just needs to get off of her high horse. Yes. Oh, yeah. She's got to prove... Shave off a few of those names. Yeah. Take off... Oh, my God. She's... And, Jesus. And you got to prove that you can rule Restoros. And she learned that the hard way. And mm-hmm. I think in the next few episodes, we're going to see her really batten down the hatches and spill some blood. Yeah. My fear is that she will lose one of her dragons along the way. I... At least yes. one. I, it's oh, probably going to be Drogon. I think she's... I think... Uh, I think she's definitely going to lose Drogon. Yeah. Because, I mean, she's going to send him you know, front front of the lines into He's battle. He's always like. been front and center. He yeah. is her firstborn. He is her yeah. baby. Drogon will probably die. I know. That's the theme of the show. If there's something that somebody loves, it's going to be, it's going to be George R.R. R. Martin, like, yep. so quick. <laughs> Amen to that. And, uh, but the thing is, every single war has its casualties. So in order to win the war, you have to change history. Houses Starks and Stark and Targaryen are going to fight together, are going to join together and fight the Lannisters instead of fighting against each other. Right. And I think the only way they can do that is when the news arrives that Jon is... For sure. Half no. Targaryen, half Stark. I, no, I, I completely agree. Um, I like that he's still there because I was going to be yes. so upset if he had to like, Just, leave. Just like, and... up and left? Oh my god, I was, so, was going to be so upset. Um... But, uh, I, and yeah, I mean, like we, like we've been saying, it's, um, it's part of that whole, like, history repeats itself thing, but not in the sense that history is happening again. I think that's, I think there's a lot to be said, too, for the houses crumbling. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, the whole, like, the idea of the Seven Kingdoms is not really a thing anymore. I mean, they... as we talked about last week. Right. It's all coming down. Just like the wall, figuratively, the houses, the major houses of Westeros are also crumbling. Crumbling or merging. I mean, or like, you merging. have houses, like, working together now. That, in the past, I don't, I can't, have ever seen that happening. Especially two houses that weren't allies in the past. I mean, mm-hmm. Targaryen and Stark? Those, Never. They fought no. against each other in Robert's Rebellion. Exactly. There were literally, I mean, Starks were the Baratheons' hugest ally. And right. the Targaryens were not. And so I, I think it's very interesting to talk about merging houses. Mm-hmm. I don't necessarily think that they'll merge um, there's a theory running around the internet that John and Danny together will get together and have a baby, and that will be the Azor Ahai, no. the Conqueror, and Wait. that just makes me Wait. feel uncomfortable. No, 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 they can't, that's... Okay, I did you see any chemistry? Because no. first of all, there should not be because I, we know what he is. I, we know he's a target. We know he's his. We he's know her he's little her baby nephew. nephew. He's her nephew, and there were so many oh. Harkins to like. Rhaegal was, you know, John was chosen by his people to lead, and Barriss and Selmy told Daenerys, you know, Rhaegar was chosen. He people followed him because they believed in what he stood for. Yeah, there were a lot of Harkenings to John being Rhaegar's son. I mean, Rhaegal freaking freaking flew over him right right when they said she said like oh god that was Rhaegal wasn't it yeah that was no that was Drogon they were all of them they all all of them that's yeah they all flew over well then he goes I'm not a Stark no because you're a Targaryen that's when the and Q dragons (laughs) no um I just I don't think that this the lack of sexual chemistry has anything to do with Amelia Clark and Kit Harington being bad actors no no I think it's the way that David and DB are writing the show I I, know I agree because I I mean, and you know, I am it. exactly. I am one to ship people together. I know, like you ship even, some weird stuff. I ship some real weird stuff. Even like, and okay, I'm gonna ease into this. Like, I don't ship Jamie and Cersei. I don't. I don't ship them. It's really gross. But and you creepy, understand it. But I get it. Yeah, no, John I, I and Danny. I get it too. I I get it. They're both very pretty. It's like okay, and they're sure. twins. They shared a freaking woman in this in, in in this country. Incest is not as weird as it right. is in our world. Exactly. Still weird, it's but, still but weird. also it's still weird. also like I'm kind of like okay, like I can see chemistry there in a real weird way. Mm-hmm. With John and Danny, the the vibe I got immediately was these are two people who can work aunt together. Nephew, aunt nephew, yeah, take care of his little Very baby face. Clearly, like yeah, aunt <laughs> nephew, like you two have a familial vibe. Of yes, anything. they do exactly, and that's actually really hard to pull off in a show. It is the fact that they don't have any sexual chemistry. I'm into None. it, and I also think that a baby would be dumb. I don't want our main heroine to become pregnant. No, that takes the fire out of her and puts it in a child. Right. That's she becomes a, a vessel for a something vessel. else. Right. And like, I'm, no. just, I'm not interested in that. No. If, if 
the baby, if they are Azora High, let it be them together as the two individuals that we have watched over these past seven years grow. And right. not some dumb baby that no one really cares about. Right. Don't make this the end of Twilight. Where the, I'm really sorry I even brought that up, but I, that's right, just what but I it, thought no, of. No, I agree. I agree. Because weird... that was... Twilight, you know, the books were fine. I read them all. I'm not going to... I did. I'm not going to lie to you. Okay. I did read them. Uh, and that was the strangest part of those books was the child that was named Every... after both the moms. It was so weird. Oh. Um, instead of focusing on John and Danny romance, I want to see romances that I do care about. You know, like Miss and Dan Grey Worm. Yes. Like um, Sam and Gilly. Like, give me those. Or Cersei and Jamie. We got a little bit of that I mean, in this episode. We do. I mean, that's just sort of the way of things. It's the way of the world. It's the yeah. way of the world. I am happy to see the relationships working out right now are like the pure and beautiful ones, like Sam and, and uh, Gilly, Gilly and Grey Worm and Miss and Day. Like, Hopefully Grey Worm survives. God, I, hope, I don't oh, think man. he will. They're real, I, they're real far away from each I, other now. I don't think he's going to be okay. I think we have very much covered this episode as much as we can. Inside there's, and out. There's so much more that we can talk about. I mean, like I said, this episode is, the rewatchability of it is super, super high. So with oh, yeah. that, I ask you, dear sweet Carly, what is your beard rating for the Queen's justice? Justice. My beard rating for this episode is a call Drogo because it starts out separate and comes together in this beautiful braid. Because just like the characters... Everything is everything is connected. Everything's connected Dirk and Gently history style. History repeating itself. History you know, repeating itself in a beautiful the braid. braid. History. The world is just a braid of hair. <laughs> Bro, the world is just Carl Drogo's braided hair. Who? I mean, yeah, that's fine. That's the, that's the philosophy I live by. And <laughs> <laughs> um, my, myself, I think I've actually given this one out before, but I am going to give the queen the queen's justice a brawn because it was effective and got the job done. Uh, plus, he was quoted in this episode. Tyrion quoted him, but Bronn himself did not get a line. So it's he showed up of, though. We saw him. We, we saw, saw his him. face. We saw his face. So, but it's a little bit out of solidarity. Like I saw you, man. True. I feel you. I really hope that you don't kill Tyrion and jump to his side, or like you and Jamie switch sides or something. Like yeah. it's just like hope for Bronn to survive this whole thing. Agreed. Okay. No, totally agreed. <laughs> and also, I just really enjoyed the episode, and I really enjoy Bronn as a character. It was great. First episode of the season that was like really, you know, it was less uh, sending out ravens and receiving ravens, and more exactly. oh my god, stuff is happening. Exactly. <laughs> Next week on Game of Thrones, the TV show. Dun dun dun. The episode is called "The Spoils of War." Uh, it sort of, we're going to see, uh, well, they said there's going to be a major battle between Daenerys and the Lannisters or so news outlets have reported. I'm not quite sure if that's going to happen yet. We do yeah. see Jamie and Bronn on a battlefield. Uh, Bria, we got some Bran and Pod fighting yes. action. Bronn and, like I said, Bronn and Jamie are going on a little date. Uh, Littlefinger is unsheathing his dagger finally. Yeah. The question is, is this Littlefinger? Because Arya's eyeing Winterfell in the preview, preview and we know she can be anyone or, you know, no one. So things are finally starting to heat up in Westeros, and with only four more episodes to finish oh. out this season, it's bound to get hot. <laughs> it's the fire side of you ice know, and fire. Because of dragons? I got you. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Anyway, um, <laughs> my name is Sophia Matthias. You can find me on Twitter at Commander Tully. My name is Carly Hill. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Chillin555, that's C-H-I-L-L-Y-N 555, and on Medium.com uh, at Hi Yes Hello. Mm. And please do us the service of following our Twitter at YouGotGotPod. Check out our weekly poll. Vote in it. We'll talk about the results in next week's episode. But that's all for this week. Thank you all so much for tuning in. And remember, the night is dark, but full of Davos. Yeah. <laughs>